Thank you, Jana, for that absolutely generous introduction. It is a pleasure to be with you. When I was young, I thought that failure was impossible. All wrongs would be righted in my time. Now I'm old, I see that failure is impossible. I pass my torch to you. Will you hold it high? For we are sowing winter wheat that other hands will harvest, that they might have enough to eat after we are gone. We will plant shade trees that we will not sit under, we'll light candles that others might see their way. We'll struggle for justice, though we'll never see it flower. Our children's children will live in peace one day. I offer you Winter Wheat by Libby Roderick. She's an American singer, poet, songwriter, and in so many ways, I feel that poem encapsulates the sacrifice of all of you educators planting winter wheat for others to harvest. That is all that we have talked about. I really feel the tapestry of life is represented and that this conference has for you been about planting winter wheat and understanding that global citizenship extends way beyond our boundaries and into and across generations. Thank you so much, Jana, for that lovely introduction to all the wonderful organizers of this World Summit of Educators Conference here at Soka University of America. It's really wonderful to be sharing some closing remarks after what has clearly been a very inspiring and engaging conference. I want to acknowledge here today the diverse group of educators from around the world. All of you here to discuss how global citizenship is evolving, how it's changing, and the crucial role that education must play to build a stronger world community in the face of very challenging global issues today. You are doing extremely crucial work and I really want to thank you. It's a crucial decade, as I'm sure we all acknowledge. We're starting and this one, and it demands a lot of all of us. We're living in truly interesting times. I've been struck uh, every time I have a, an opportunity to reflect on remarks for a group like this by just how much in just over one and a half short years, the context of the work that we all do has changed and the task ahead has become even clearer and more urgent. But the truth is, it has not become any easier. These three words continue to frame what we do these days. Uncertainty, inequity, and urgency. But the truth is, however we choose, however you choose to shape this narrative, we have to start with the idea that for almost any part of the world, inclusion, resilience, and shared prosperity must be at the heart of how we will and we must build forward better for the, from these disruptions that we have faced. We keep saying that this is not just a once in a generation reset. The organization I work for, the World Resources Institute, works at the intersection of environment and development. And we see this opportunity as a once in a century reset. And education, education has to be a major part of how we invest for a more sensible future. And so it is indeed a once in a century reset that is defined, I believe, by four key trends. These are the trends that are defining how you will continue to shape and plant winter wheat for the future. Growing inequality that is linked to a very deep crisis in justice around the world, including injustice in climate finance, injustice in trade. We're seeing it across the board, including now injustice in vaccine equity. 
all of this will stifle our collective ability to transform the lives we seek to transform. We also have a pandemic that is raging now in very divergent ways across the world. It is in its third and fourth and probably fifth wave in so many parts of the world, the worst pandemic in our lifetime. But we also have, as a result, the worst economic downturn we've ever seen. And it's made worse by the fact that it's happening around the world simultaneously. What's tragic is that the recovery is divergent across the world. And then we have the big one, climate change, an issue that continues to shape our future. So I'm delighted that at the Soka University Forum, Family and Network, you're alive and well today because there's a lot of work to do, a lot of work ahead that will require important players like you. Now, as leaders around the world begin to kickstart uh, their struggling economies, it's crucial that we do not go back to the old ways of doing things. Everything will have to change, including our education systems and how we prepare our young people in particular for the future. There's been a missing bridge across the globe. Finance has been missing so that we can invest meaningfully across the board. And for the first time in decades, we're seeing trillions of dollars on the table. And in the coming months, we'll see some of the largest public spending programs in history. It is absolutely consequential that a lot of those resources are invested in what makes that machine work and that is in education. Addressing climate change, of course, is part of the recovery and it will require smart and forward thinking in how we prepare and unleash new capacity. And that can only be in the hands of education innovators like you. What a tragedy it would be if these resources were simply invested in the same old risky ways of doing things. What governments should really do is avoid trying to boost their economies in the wake of a global health crisis by exacerbating others. And that we must invest in uh, most importantly. We know that the cr these crises don't affect people equally. Many crises simply don't. It's the poor and the vulnerable that are least, at the least protected in terms of health, economic crisis, and so to environmental damage. So building resilience and adapting against the impacts of this crisis, climate crisis, the injustice uh, situation is crucial, especially for the most vulnerable among us. We know now that climate change will thrust 100 million people into poverty. Three billion people already do not have adequate water, for example, not to mention the impact of this pandemic. And on poverty levels, we will see poverty go up for the very first time in 22 years. We have been making great strides eliminating poverty. And now all of a sudden, we will see the first increase. So the scale of change that's needed is massive. And the focus must be on how we both address these impacts, but also how we build resilience for future impacts like this. And so often in our discussions about climate, about biodiversity, about ecosystem collapse, and these are the things that I deal with every day, the focus is often on the technical elements of what these things are, what needs to be done. And we know these really well, but we do not talk enough about what it will take to make this transformation happen. And that the truth is, Education is at the heart of how we unlock capacity and mobilize it to address the greatest challenges of our time. We know, for example, that achieving net zero emissions for those who are focusing on climate will require that we cut emissions by half each decade, while the current focus has continued to be on technical innovations and how they can accomplish the first reduction. The second, third, and even fourth will require major behavior change. And we know for that sort of behavior change to happen, our education must be 
invested in and unleashed. We know from the Commission of Ed on Education, for example, that there's no chance of addressing the climate crisis if we do not get more progress on education. That's a fact. Education will play a crucial role in building the workforce for a green economy. You, and yet we, we're simply not doing enough. I learned this from my friends at the Commission of Education too. How will we get to avoid cl the climate crisis when less than 80%, we have approximately 80% of our global youth say that they value education as part of the climate solution, yet only three countries have committed to the national climate curriculum, including climate change in their curricula. We know that less than 40% of the national commitments to reduce emission includes plans for actually building skills and reskilling. And more than one in five have no plans at all, no plans at all for training or capacity development measures. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are to get there, how is it possible if 90% of climate finance is dedicated to technology, renewable energy, sustainable transport, and energy efficiency, and these are all important, but we cannot unleash the potential of these without addressing the investment too in education. Marginal amounts of resources at the moment are invested in education. So an, an education for climate action simply cannot wait, and they go hand in hand. And we're hearing more and more of that, and I hope that people like you in the world uh, summit for educators will begin to engage more deeply in these discussions in the climate space because we need you we need you to make this a truly transformative uh, climate action decade now it's true that marginalized communities can be empowered by education i know that's one of the things that you have been discussing and what it includes education that actually advances our understanding of environmental education as well. Now, how to advance peace in an increasingly fractured and polarized world and how we actually take action when you th see things are not going well. But all of this takes a tremendous amount of patience, commitment and persistence, ingredients that most educators naturally have. And it is a different kind of education from a typical classroom variety. It is very heavy lifting work, work that organizations like the Greenbelt Movement, which my mother Wangari Mathai started in 1977, and for which that work was rewarded with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, as Jana mentioned in her introduction. She understood profoundly well that education is about bridging the knowledge and practice gap. The movement, the Greenbelt Movement, sought to respond to the needs of rural Kenyan women, largely illiterate. Many of them had not gone to school, but they were reporting by observation that their streams were drying up, their food supplies were less secure, and they had to walk further and further away to get firewood for fuel and building and fencing. The movement encouraged the women to work together, to grow trees. These are farmers and they know how to grow. We keep saying that you don't have to teach a farmer how to grow. They know how to grow. Get out of the way, but help them organize so that they can do what they do even better. Plant trees to bind the soil, to store rainwater, to provide food and firewood. And at the end, they received a small monetary token of appreciation for their work that continued to propel and generate more interest in this work. And this work blossomed and extended beyond Kenya to other countries in Africa, and also at one point to the wonderful city, uh, country of Haiti. Now, shortly after starting this work, my mother saw that behind the everyday hardship faced by populations, hardships like poverty, unemployment, education, environmental degradation, water scarcity, deforestation, even food insecurity, that underneath all of these, like almost any issues, were deeper issues that needed to be addressed. Issues of disempowerment, 
issues of disenfranchisement, political and econo economic misgovernance, inequities, loss of values and traditional practices. These had previously cushioned and enabled communities to protect their livelihoods and work together for the benefit of all. That the symptoms of the erosion of all of these was what they were witnessing on the land. And to do what they were doing both selflessly and honestly for the common good. The Green Belt Movement started education seminars, which they called community education and empowerment seminars. And these were three-day seminars to encourage individuals and communities to analyze why they faced these challenges. There were three-day sessions. And the very first day, they would look at why have we faced these challenges? What is it about these challenges? What are these challenges? And why they lacked the initiative to change their political, economic, and environmental circumstances? What could they do themselves? And what did they need to reach out to others? And through these seminars, participants began to recognize that, for example, that for years, they had been placing their trust on predatory leadership, leaders who had betrayed them and their aspirations. And they had placed everything, even things they could do for themselves. And on the other hand, even in the communities, they were undermining and sabotaging their own lives by not working themselves with the environment and managing their natural resources wisely. As a result, they suffered all manner of challenges. And this is the work, this is the moment when a lot of communities through these education systems under trees were about opening the eyes of communities to say, there are some things I can do for myself. That is the noble work that education in all its forms does to empower, to enable one to find their agency and to begin to do things for themselves. So in 2004, when Professor Mathai won the Nobel Peace Prize, it was because she made that critical link through the work of the Green Belt Movement that the environment, democracy, and peace were inextricably linked. And this was one of the most important contributions. And at the heart of that was a community education initiative that was transforming lives, transforming women, encouraging women to organize, unleashing their agency to take charge of their own lives. Such is the power of education. GBM, the Green Belt Movement, also had an unparalleled grassroots structure, and that facilitated how they worked and how they continued to do um, the crit to restore critical ecosystems. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a special year for the Soka University family. You are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Aliso Wehio California campus and your undergraduate program at the university as well. And then also opening your new life sciences program. But today also coincides with the 25th anniversary of a major speech in 96 at Columbia University that your founder, Daisaku Ikeda, uh, um, issued. And he, I found compelling the ideas that he presented about global citizenship and how they define now the university's mission. I was struck by the fact that in describing what he noted as the three principles of global citizenship, Professor Ikeda said, over the past several decades, I have been privileged to meet and converse with many people from all walks of life. And I've given the matter some thought, he said. Certainly, global citizenship is not determined merely by the number of languages one speaks or the number of countries to which one has traveled. I have many friends who could be considered quite ordinary citizens, but who possess an inner nobility, who have never traveled beyond their native place, yet they are genuinely concerned for the peace and prosperity of the world. How true that is to this day. It is true because global citizenship is not about boundaries. It is not about languages. It is actually across generations. It is across, it is all those things 
that global citizenship is an expression of how we show up for others across generations and intergenerational uh, equity, but also across geographies. I was also struck by the fact that these three principles he outlined for global citizenship, generally around the virtues of interconnectedness of all life, courage and compassion, they become more and more relevant with every passing year. And perhaps none more important than this one and the one that has just passed, where so much happened to us as a human family for the very first time. But here's what we can all do. There's a very powerful emerging paradigm that I think provides a really important framework for how all of us can see the world ahead, our role in it, and even perhaps begin to engage our global citizenship in ways that leverages the talents that we bring, our time that we offer, and our treasure that we offer as well. It's one that I hope everyone here today will find a way to adopt a piece of. If you take nothing else from me today, I hope you take this. We should all invest in nature, ensure that nature that surrounds us is at the heart of how we move forward, is at the heart of what we teach that our children and any people we seek to educate would have nature and do things for the good of the environment. Because as my grandmother used to say, the environment is the source of everything good. Nothing bad comes from the environment, she used to say. So if it is a paradigm that is reflected and encapsulated in four amazing words. One, produce. Number two, protect. Number three, reduce. And number four, restore. So I'll start with the first one, produce. The global population will grow from 7 billion in 2010 to close to 10 billion in 2050. And you can imagine the overall demand for food that will come to feed those people. Overall food demand is expected to increase by 50%. And that is absolutely unprecedented. Yet we have hundreds of millions of people today going hungry. Agriculture already uses half of the world's vegetated land and is a major driver of the destruction of our forests. Agriculture and related other land use changes produce 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to produce our food more efficiently and sustainably. And how we communicate and train the future food production um, talent is crucial because we, it will depend, it will determine how the future of our environment is sustained, the balance of the environment is sustained. The growth of agriculture today is simply unsustainable. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, 80% of all food consumed in non-industrialized countries, so this is mainly countries outside the most advanced economies, is produced by small-scale farmers. And these small-scale farmers, most of us know them, 70% of them are women. And they create, we have to create opportunities for them to produce much more efficiently and to benefit from their trade in ways that is more just. It is absolutely unconscionable that the poorest people in the world are the food producers, the holders of our food basket. That ought to concern all of us. So we have to produce much better. We have to produce more renewable energy. So we give people the choices they need. We have to begin to train people in new and innovative ways. And the renewable energy uh, investments will only succeed if we can reskill and retool people for those new industries. The second paradigm shift is around protection. I've always been struck by the fact that I live on the African continent where one of the most beautiful forests, the Congo forest, sits. Now the world has three main lungs, lungs that continue to clean our air and ensure that we survive and sustains life as we know it. One is the Amazon in South America. We have the Congo in Africa. 
and we have the forests of Southeast Asia. Of the world's three largest tropical rainforests that serve as um, lungs of the world, only the Congo forest, believe it or not, is enough at the moment, is the only net um, healthy lung, is the only healthy lung we have because the Amazon forest is on the edge of becoming an emitter of carbon. Instead of absorbing carbon, it is emitting carbon. And forests in Southeast Asia are already emitting carbon. So we have to protect the green spaces around us in new and extremely innovative ways. And the way we teach people to love nature, to begin when they're young, to experience nature, the value of experiential learning in ensuring that the protection of our green spaces going forward is ensured and the pressure is reduced is extremely important in your hands. As educators, we have to ensure that protection of ecosystems is something that comes not from the intellect, but from the heart. That protection of the remaining forests of green spaces around us, wherever we are, that we begin to inspire young people to know that they need to have green spaces around them as much as they need to breathe. So protection, a very important part of how we move forward. The third one is reduce. If food loss and waste were a country, believe it or not, it would be the third largest emitter of carbon after the United States and China. We simply waste too much food around the world. We waste it in different parts of the value chain, but we simply waste too much of it. In Africa, we have to reduce the amount of food that's wasted at harvest. Post-harvest losses are a huge business leak for many in the sector. We have to invest in supply chains, cold chains. It is almost impossible to transport fish or other uh, perishables more than uh, uh, kilometers away from where they are produced because there's no cold chain storage for them. We have got to close the food gap um, and that will be more difficult if we do not have people skilled and tooled to do that, particularly women who are involved in this sector. And another potential area for reduction is in the wonderful circular economy. It's really a wonderful, um, always wonderful to explore that in almost every, any culture, almost every culture, the, the concept of circularity has always existed. As a child growing up, I remember uh, uh, we used to have to save all our newspapers, all our glass bottles, all our tin cans, and somebody would come around and he would pick them up. Uh, often these were men, they came and they picked up every single newspaper, uh, glass bottle, Circularity was embedded in the culture. And as a child, I grew up knowing that I didn't just throw those away. What happened to that culture? We've got to begin to inculcate that culture of circularity so that we show and demonstrate that that is important. We've got to reduce and reuse the resources that we have. It cannot be that creating circularity is a commercial venture. It has to be something that our children learn is crucial for survival as they know it. Finally, restore. Africa has an ambitious restoration agenda and the rest of the world does too. In my job here at the World Resources Institute, one of the things I do is advance the cause for the restoration of our forests. We need to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land on the African continent in this decade. It is an absolutely ambitious agenda that is taking government, the international community, the private sector, and the opportunities for investing in tree-based businesses is something that very few people understand. The economies around the world that actually invest in green, uh, in tree businesses as part of their livelihoods. With a continent today that is the youngest in the world, this is a new opportunity that we have to begin to teach about, to train about, because how else will people find out that across the entire forestry value chain are opportunities to unleash business ideas that will also be part of restoring our precious landscapes. 
These are the exciting opportunities for education today. But that opportunity has to be matched, of course, by investments in this area. And a major barrier for this has always been the loans. Tree take, trees take a long time to grow. So we need to be as patient with the financing as it, they require. We've also traditionally just focused, and this is something that uh, it's almost like how we grow up and people tell us, well, you, when you grow up, what do you wanna be? And in Kenya, it is one of five things, pilot, doctor, engineer, you could name them on one hand. The same with businesses, when we are training opportunities for investments, opportunities for protection, what opportunities are there beyond the usual coffee, tea, staple crops, oftentimes land restoration entrepreneurs are working with new crops, food crops, uh, fruit crops, and they're not seen as entrepreneurs because they're restoring landscapes and they're ensuring that we have enough food. Those are business models we must continue to familiarize and ensure we customize with our, our young people so that they can get into and accelerate the work that we need to do. It's going to take both, all, the, all of us really, we must deliver uh, the, the sort of tools that are needed, but also the platforms and opportunities for people to get into restoration. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to deliver hope to an economic transformation to the youth among us. This is something that Jana mentioned is a very close to my heart. Youth in Africa will continue to be the drivers of innovation, and they will be the drivers of the many agendas we have set for ourselves at the international level. I don't know how many people know that the average age of Africans today is 19 years old. It surprises me all the time. These are the challenges, the change agents we have to continue to empower. And I've always been inspired by a, a movement called the Civilian Conservation Corps in the US in the 30s that rescued a lost generation of youth and restored their um, ability to invest in natural capital. They planted billions of trees, terraced and created windbreaks, soil anchors, restored uh, forests and created the American ski culture. Today, we need to harness the energy and enthusiasm of this generation of young people, especially in Africa, by inspiring a restoration generation. It has been done before, it can be done again. And so as we reflect on what it actually means to be a good global citizen, engaged and ready to serve, let's commit ourselves to leverage education in new ways that are more inclusive, that will catalyze positive change for the many. Finally, I'm sure you all heard me talk enough and we could go into the question and answer. I want to leave you with the words of Arundhati Roy. She's written one of the most beautiful essays, The Pandemic is a Portal. And she said, whatever it is about COVID-19, it has made the mighty meal and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, learning and longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch the future to our past and refusing to acknowledge that a rapture has actually happened and that that rapture actually exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have created us for ourselves. We have created a doomsday machine that we have to change. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality, she said. She said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and emerging their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. So my friends in education, we can choose to walk through this portal, dragging our carcasses of our prejudice, our hatred, and our avarice, our data banks of dead ideas, our rivers, smoky skies behind us. Or we can make a separate decision. We can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world 
and ready to fight for it. I know that the World Summit for Educators is ready to fight for a more just, green, and climate resilient future. May you continue planting shade trees, lighting candles, and imagining this world anew that future generations might actually live in peace. President Paisa, I look forward to being on campus and experiencing the beauty and seeing that lovely building. And thank you all for having me here today. I look forward to your questions and more, a little bit more of a conversation. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Winjira, for such an inspiring speech. We really enjoyed hearing from you and uh, being able to hear not only of your experience, but the long lineage that you bring to your work and how it's transforming not only your country of Kenya, but the whole planet. We're very honored to have you here and uh, really grateful that you could join us tonight. <clears throat> we have a few questions from the audience and uh, I'll just go into them right away here because they're coming in really fast here. So um, one of the questions is asking about how we can com combat all of the different degradation of our planet in the face of corruption, in the face of other forces that are kind of opposing nature and opposing the, the sort of grassroots type of education that, that you and your mother have been working on. How do we deal with, with governments and with all of those institutions? And, and how can those be effectively um, navigated in order to bring about the kind of change that you'd like to see. Yeah, do you want me to, I can go ahead and answer that. Uh, um, you know, that's a very uh, relevant question because governments in many countries are the custodians of natural resources and are the custodians of forests. This is something that the Greenbelt Movement faced on and on and over and over again. We cannot take on government directly on our own. We have to form movements of solidarity. We've got to align with people who are working in these spaces. There are always people who are working to protect green spaces, understand the constitutional provisions, understand the opportunities for the rule of law. Now corruption or what we would also say gaps in accountability and transparency are numerous, but we have to start with what we can do. And in most cases where people are, you can protect the environment around you. Most of the communities that we work with are able to ensure that their farms and their areas, their neighborhoods, that they protect the trees in their neighborhoods, the green spaces in their neighborhoods. Because government is not only national government, government is also local government. And I've been struck, Brian, at how few of us know our local authorities. We often know the president, we know the vice president, but we don't really know the person who's in charge of education in my district. Who is that? The person who's in charge of environment in my district. Often those people are available. In Kenya, we have a very decentralized uh, system of governance now. And so our MCA is the person in charge of the place, the neighborhood where I live is the person I ought to know very well. And those meetings I need to engage in and attend. And so it's knowing who is around you, who is in charge, who are the people who drive this agenda in your neighborhood and start there. Don't worry about the bigger picture because that will be extremely overwhelming for most of us, but we can make a difference in the spaces where we are. And believe it or not, as we all do that, it will begin to have resonance because in Kenya, we now have a situation where we have a constitution that has enshrined into it the protection of green spaces and the right to a green and healthy environment. That is in the constitution. So we can leverage that with our local authorities. Hmm. Great. Um, I have a question that asks how we can build the kind of coordination and collaboration in order to craft new forms of education that will encompass global citizenship and address global climate change. Have you seen examples um, of new sort of sprouts 
of educational initiatives that you find inspiring? I have. I have found um, when Janet gave the introduction, she talked about emotional intelligence. I have found more and more that uh, teaching about a mindset change, the idea of the behavior change uh, is really crucial. So often we focus on what's technical, but really do we focus on shifting mindset that the more I've worked and now in my current work, I do a lot more work with government. And when you go into some of these offices, you meet people and realize that actually these technocrats sitting and making decisions about the future of our forests, the future of our roads and how urbanization will happen in our cities. It's not that they want to cut every tree in sight. They actually don't even see them, believe it or not. They have not been trained to see nature as beautiful. They've been trained to see real estate through which these roads must pass. And that has been extremely humbling because I always thought there must be extremely mean people sitting somewhere carving out a decision to destroy this one green space we have. But when you start to talk to them, you realize that the mindset is such that the framing and what they believe to be true has never been about the beauty of nature. They have never stepped into a forest. They don't know what you're talking about when you talk about this forest is beautiful. What, what are you talking about? How do we incorporate uh, education that is experiential? How do you make sure that people, children grow up knowing that this is part of my life? I absolutely have to take a walk in the forest to feel good. Today in Nairobi, after the, the pandemic, the green spaces have been the most patronized of any social spaces in the city. Nobody has seen so many people going out into the forest. And as more and more people build in it, a protection of those green spaces, nobody will dare to touch Karura Forest today because everybody's using it and they're loving it. And we can only protect what we love. If you do not love it, and you can, you only, it is the wonderful saying, I'll find it so that I can give it, Brian, before the end of this, that you are taught, you have to be taught about these things for you to love them. You love what you know, and you know what you're taught. And so this is a very important part of how do we make people love the right things by teaching them. Wow. Um, so uh, this is wonderful. And um, I have another question that asks from, from someone from uh, French West Indies uh, asking about how urban growth is balanced against the need for environmental preservation. And in particular, what a green city in Africa or in other developing countries might look like. Yeah. Really great question. Um, it's one of my absolute passions right now. Africa's cities are the fastest urbanizing in the world, and they are actually growing in very unsustainable and unplanned ways. Green cities are cities that are also inclusive. They're cities that are built so that everybody has access to them. They're cities that are built so that pedestrians who are walking are walking safely and not competing with vehicles on the road. There are cities that are built so that you can ride non-motorized vehicles like bicycles and at the same time walk and at the same time have vehicles. There are cities that prioritize public transportation. It's going to be extremely crucial that our cities as we grow up are cities that invest in moving masses of people, not just a few, because we are growing more and more. And our transportation systems today are worse than when I was growing up. I remember taking buses everywhere as a child. Today, there's not one bus in sight in Nairobi. Why? These are the cities of the future. These are the cities we're trying to reimagine. Uh, and one of the things that, especially those of us in Africa, we have no excuse to have cities that are not green. Vegetation in our parts of the world grow very fast. You can mature trees in 15 to 20 years. And so lining 
cities with as many trees as possible to keep the temperatures down, to allow people to walk around, greenways that connect cities and neighborhoods so that you can walk around. That is the city that I dream about. My own city, but cities across the African continent. And the good news is, for the person who asked this question, a lot of that infrastructure has not been built. A lot of that infrastructure is yet to be built. So the work we have is to help inspire and train people to see that trees in cities are a good thing. They're not, a, they're not a hindrance. And how do we work around them? We see that in a lot of progressive cities. And a lot of progressive cities are knocking down infrastructure to actually put in place green spaces, to, to put in place greenways so they encourage the people to walk. You know, Brian, when the, the pandemic hit, a lot of African cities, public transportation was halted, the little public transportation we had. And people found out it is almost impossible to walk to work. They had to cross huge highways. They had to try and get to places that they had never tried to get to on foot. We must begin to create opportunities for people to walk. So mobility is important and inclusion is important. Who are these cities for? They ought to be for everybody. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask a question uh, that refers to global citizenship and how it relates to the day to day. I mean, a, a lot of people, especially in the developing world, are living their lives, they're working, they're trying to care for their families. How is it possible to, for people all around the world to recognize in their daily lives and to be reminded of the importance of being a global citizenship? I love that question, Brian, because I asked it myself. And uh, I always go back to the fact that global citizenship means that I engage, that I am awake to what's happening around me, that I may not want to be, you know, in Kenya, you tell people that uh, uh, you must care about politics. You need to care about how you are governed. And it used to mean that you have to run for office. No. You could care about how you're governed and therefore you make sure you vote. You should care about how you're governed and therefore you invest and support people who are running for office. You could care how you vote, you, how, you could care about how you're governed and then you could put yourself forward for leadership. There are multiple ways of engaging. The most important thing is that global citizens, we engage, we don't sit on the sidelines. I always tell people that one of the most beautiful green spaces in Nairobi today was a green space called Uhuru Park. And it's a space that my mother and the Greenbelt Movement protected. But they protected it not because they themselves saw that it was in danger. It was a young law school student who in his home saw that his father was planning a building in that park. And he thought that was unacceptable. He was awake to what was going on around him. And he took that information. He could do nothing. He was a young student at the University of Nairobi. He couldn't do anything about it, but he did not just sit with that information. He took that information to those he knew could do something. And today, thanks to that young man, I hope he's a thriving lawyer somewhere. He did what he needed to do. He engaged and he brought that information. When we see something, we have to say something. It is, I always believe, my mother told me so many times that good ideas don't come to one person at a time. When you see something, say something. Otherwise that idea disappears and it goes to someone else. I always remember that young man, a young law school student. He was at, just in his late teens, early twenties. And he made sure that somebody knew Uhuru Park was in trouble. We can all be global citizens if we are awake to what's going on around us. Um, this is a great uh, way to segue into a different question, which is focusing in on the power of youth. And this person is asking, why is it that youth's roles are important? And have you examples of when you've felt the power of youth? And how do you suggest that young people and the youth can grow and become capable and contributive global citizens. And I think a lot of them feel powerless. And so I think maybe I it's say, not the case. 
Yeah, but I would say young people have felt powerless in the past, but they are starting to realize that they are the majority. 80% uh, of Kenyans today are under the age of 35. Imagine that. 80% of them, the average age, as I mentioned in my remarks of Africans is 19 years old. They are realizing that there are more of them. They can actually, if they organized themselves, if they engaged in affinity groups of issues that they care about, they can support each other to engage across the board. They are highly educated. They are very frustrated with the inertia and the greed, selfishness, and, and apathy that they see around them. But we are starting to see, we saw it in Europe with Greta Thunberg, who decided enough was enough, and because of her activism, policy has changed. We're seeing more and more of those young African leaders today on the African continent, making their voices heard in the ballot boxes. They're going and running for office in historically young ages of people and they're voting for each other. They are engaging, they're registering to vote in large numbers. So young people are demonstrating their activism in extremely, incredibly interesting ways. African youth today are some of the most innovative in the world. A lot of the growing businesses in the digital sector on the African continent are, are businesses that are controlled and managed by young people. They're trying to resolve the issue of corruption using technology. They know that, uh, blockchain and all of these other technologies will help. They understand them and they're leveraging them. And of course, today the digital world has so much power that gives young people some leverage that we could only dream about democratizing media in a way that completely allows for transparency in new ways. I think young people are going to change the world. We can see it on our continent as well. We are starting to see the end of an era of absolute dictatorship because you cannot have that situation when young people control the numbers. As soon as they're able to engage as much as they're engaging across different sectors, we'll start to see that change. But the young people, Brian, also have a deep sense of hope. They don't have, uh, they do not, uh, they, they tend to be extremely optimistic and they always see the, the bright side of things. And this is the difference. They're leaning forward and they're starting to take charge. And I think that's exciting. I cannot wait to see what many of them do. I work with a lot of the climate activists and they're incredibly courageous and they're incredibly engaged. So this leads me to a question of my own, which is how can we at Soka University or other liberal arts type universities that care deeply about the world help and connect with activists and youth in Africa and contribute to some of this effort. Are there ways that people in the US or across nations, across oceans can join together and foster this kind of grassroots type change on a planetary level? You know, one of the things, whenever we talk to young people and we say, you know, what, what is it that you don't have? What's holding you back? Often they say, you know, people don't take us seriously. We don't, they don't give us platforms to speak and express ourselves. They don't pay attention to us. Creating spaces for young people to engage meaningfully, giving them the authority uh, to come in and, and, and engage and meet people who they can connect with in places of influence is an extremely valuable thing for them because they often are in, at the periphery and it's very difficult to break through. So one of the things that we are trying to do is ensure that we create platforms. We have organizations led by them. They will continue to be seen and heard and make decisions around what they want to see. We're completely out of touch as far as they're concerned. And I don't think that we can connect as much to what they want to see and they want to do. So at the Wangari Mathai Foundation, for example, all the programs are led by young people because they, they create them themselves. On Valentine's Day, they decided to go and wrap every tree they could find with hearts and say, for the love of trees, leave these trees alone. A campaign that resonated. I don't think I'd have come up with that idea. They express themselves, they go out and they are being seen and heard. 
And that's going to be really important going forward. So let's create platforms for them and opportunities. The world's um, summit of educators is a really good platform for many young people's voices to be heard and teachers and educators are constantly preparing these young people for a world of with confidence investing in their ability to believe in themselves that's really important wonderful um one of our questions is focusing on empathy and as as you know the recipe for global citizenship includes courage compassion wisdom and imaginary empathy to reach out to others and so the question is asking what seems to be missing in the world is empathy to imagine the suffering of others somewhere far away. Youth education is important, but how can we enhance empathy in education? You know, Brian, I, I don't know any other way um, of enhancing empathy than helping bring people into other people's spaces. The, the world we live in is so unequal and unjust and, I, and, and you would be absolutely forgiven for not getting it if you live in a bubble. And so how we create opportunities for people to spend time in spaces that make them uncomfortable. Um, there are universities around the world and I love programs that send people out into the world to spend not a week, not a month, a year in spaces that transform them forever. I always admired the US Peace Corps because the US Peace Corps invested in uh, young people, sending them to very difficult parts of the world. And then after that, they came and decided what they wanted to do for graduate school. And almost without exception, they would pick meaningful um, they would make meaningful choices that are based on an experience they had. Talk to any Peace Corps volunteer. It changed their lives almost to the person. And I think experiences like those, studies abroad, uh, encouraging our students to go out because it's also the, nobody told us that actually that's the only time you will have to be able to do that. Depending on what you do for your career, you might be lucky, but in that education journey, is the only opportunity you have to deep dive into places, to pick your backpack and go and live in Peru, to go and live in Kenya, to go and spend time in India and really understand so that when you are the Minister of Foreign Affairs, when you are in charge of the foundation, you know exactly what is needed. It is intuitive. Part of that building empathy is experience being in those spaces yourself. And I think that's the best thing education uh, institutions can do is to deepen their programming locally too. You could be in a neighborhood and just go in Nairobi, just going into some of the, the least um, uh, developed uh, parts of the city is humbling. And our children grow up not even knowing these spaces exist. That's unconscionable. Yeah, that's really true. And I have another question here that, that tries to take this concept of empathy a little farther in that it's asking about how we can really feel for the natural world, how we can cultivate that kind of empathy for the, the, the world. And, and the way the question's written, it notes that environmental scholars and educators arguing that some of the root causes of social injustice and violence are the same as the root cause of environmental destruction, which can be an artificial division in people's minds between self and other, as it may be applied to other people, but also to the natural world. And I just, they were wondering if you could just share your thoughts about this concept and how we can remedy this destructive way of thinking. Yeah, you know, I, I as I said, um, there's a Senegalese educator who said, um, and he said it much more elegantly than me, I'll find it, but he said that you, you will love what you, you know and you'll know what you're taught. That's a, the essence of it all. We have to, for people to appreciate nature, to love nature, you have to experience it. You have to be out there in it. I spent some time in Sweden uh, 
because we have family there. And some of the experiences of children in Sweden remind me exactly of the experiences my mother described growing up in rural Kenya. Those two societies couldn't be more different. My mother in rural Kenya and a Swedish child in Sweden. And yet the love for nature, she always pinned back to the fact that she would spend hours playing in rivers with frogs and frog eggs and tadpoles and the, the beauty and wonder of nature that captivated her as a child. We've got to restore that sense of wonder in nature. Because if you do that, you cannot imagine but protecting it for others to enjoy it too. And I see that in, in Sweden. You couldn't possibly deny those young Swedes and eventually they are the ones who become the custodians of those forests in whatever careers they make. You cannot tell them that you can't, you, this forest will soon be cut down. They wanna know, excuse me? And the same thing with us. Why has the river disappeared? This is the forest that I grew up in. There's a personal connection and you can't make that up. And so we have to invest very deeply in investing in nature. We have some of the most beautiful landscapes in this world on the savannas of forests of this continent, but we have commercialized them in our minds. Our mindset doesn't see these forests as things of beauty and wonder. We have to shift that. I'm going to ask the question, largely the same one, but from the perspective of a teacher who, in many cases, a teacher is hard pressed to find inspiration and wonder with all the difficulties they face, lack of funding, challenges of all sorts. And so the question is asking, you know, what can we do to encourage educators and how can they develop skills to enhance their own wonder, curiosity, and love for the nature of the world into their classroom. Are there examples of, of ways that educators can group together? And I'm thinking also of what you talked about earlier, where you described community education and empowerment seminars that your mother set up as part of the Greenbelt movement. Are there examples of teachers getting together and having community education and empowerment seminars that you know of? in Africa or elsewhere in the world? Um, I don't, and, and to a certain extent, this could be an outcome of the World Summit of Educators. I mean, I don't know of, of those. I know that um, there are always teachers being recognized for their innovative ideas, and they're, they're especially in the, in the climate space now, desperately looking for, for examples, shining examples of educators who are fostering this sort of change. But I don't know of a formal grouping, uh, which except that I know um, of, of groups, indigenous groups like the Africa Biodiversity Network that is working on, um, that is working on ensuring that communities actually understand the wisdom of the elders. So this intergenerational uh, exchange of ideas. And that is one of those, the Africa Biodiversity Network does it. Um, and different people do it so that they can begin to share knowledge, the indigenous wisdom of the elders. That I know is happening quite a bit on the African continent, in South Africa, in, in Kenya. It's understanding just the intuition that young people had of nature. I went on a safari once um, and it was a different kind of safari because we've always gone on safari to see big animals. And then you go on a safari and this one was about insects and the children had to focus on the insects they were, they were seeing and that was unusual went on another one and it was only about grasses appreciating the grasses that are out there and then another one just on looking at the animal footprints that they were wanted children to learn when you see this footprint it's an ungulate if you see this footprint it's a carnivore if you see this footprint it's an elephant so helping to begin to unlock the juices in young people so that they can have the curiosity. That's the word I was looking for, the curiosity uh, and learn to love more. My children love to do that. They go around and they, they learned about all sorts of insects and all sorts of 
footprints, but we don't do it enough. I wish there was a way that education would really shift more towards that. Kids tend to light up uh, when they have those experiences and adults too. So I think more of that is needed, but the intergenerational um, conversations and intergenerational opportunities are fascinating because we learn just how intuitive it was for many um, to experience nature. Wonderful. Um, when Jira, we're almost out of time. We only have a couple more minutes. Um, I'm going to maybe go through two more questions, but I also want to give you a chance to just sum up and and say some final words before we we sadly have to bid you adieu for now um, until you come to our campus, of course. Um, some of the questions that are remaining um, talk about equality. Talk about how education is polarized. And again, some of these forces that make people feel powerless. And what can people be, how can you remind people about their power? How can they be reminded about their power and how can they be able to maintain motivation to continue to fight, to be a global citizen every day? What are some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a struggle and the inequality in education is global. There are um, those inequalities around the world. I actually feel that I've subscribed to the, the, the thinking that how, I, how are the spaces where we learn are, are extremely important. And sometimes one of the starkest uh, discrepancies in education is the fact that beautiful spaces are often in schools that are very well healed. And so you have the money and the resources to invest. And then you go to a school with very little resources and it reflects in how the school actually looks, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, educators and especially teachers at the Wangai Mathai Foundation, we invest quite a bit in helping teachers um, and, and we are developing curriculum we would love to work with any of you doing this is how do you get teachers to create beautiful working spaces because the environment in a school is very much um, a determinant of how learning happens in that school and we found that the engagement of teachers the engagement of the school community as you will is a function of the environment in a school so sometimes we've gone to a school and just worked with the kids to green the school, to, to put, you know, some of these schools, especially in, in, in the urban slums, are, are concrete jungles. There's not a green leaf in sight. So how do we create opportunities for the kids to plant something so they see green? And the minute we do that, it changes the perception of kids about their school, the parents about that school, the teachers in that school, Everybody felt good about the school and we had just helped put some greenery on the, on the periphery. So I think that there is a lot to be said for the engagement of the school community, making sure that everybody feels engaged and certainly that uh, teachers and students feel that people care about this school. So who engages, who are involved in the, on the school administration? Every school has a school board. And so who are those people? Do people know who they are? Do they show up? Does the, do the people in this school feel um, people care about them in the long term? Is there some sort of a growth, uh, a future, um, investing in the future and not just uh, the passing time? So I think that the school community is crucial in how they engage in, in education spaces and also what those spaces look and feel like. Uh, it's very easy to feel like, oh, we don't have resources, but it's not difficult to keep a school clean, to plant a few things, especially in our part of the world, things just grow uh, and make sure that people are experiencing and seeing beauty around them. Uh, this is very inspiring, Wintura. Um, We're almost out of time. And so I thought I'd just turn it back to you just to wrap up. And if you can reflect a little bit on some of the things that you've seen, some of the things you've talked about, some other ideas that you might want to leave us with, just give you a chance to sum up. 
Yeah, well, thank you, Brian. First of all, just to appreciate the community for inviting me to join you. I have been honored. I have uh, experienced uh, the, the Soka University family. I used to say I have never met a community that is everywhere like Soka <laughs> and University and, and the Soka community. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And thank you for honoring my mother on your campus, Brian, because I know just how much she connected with the principles we're talking about today. I know for sure that education is at the heart of how we transform the lives of everyone. First of all, ensuring that everybody has access to a decent education. And I, I feel like with that comes the responsibility to help others, to support others, to have the same opportunity. And I also hope that as educators in the spaces where we work, that we'll continue to push the envelope on what the national curriculum looks like. It's not everybody who can talk to the institutes of curriculum development and help them shift. But if more of us lean in, if more institutions like yours, Brian, lean in and help to inspire governments to rethink education for the 21st and 22nd century, we will begin to see a lot more happening around building mindset about around the heart and not always around the intellect. And that is the shift that's needed because the sort of wisdom that's required, the sort of challenges we are facing in the world today require that we leverage uh, other parts of, of ourselves and bring other parts of ourselves to bear. Because who knew we would be at home uh, for a year and a half, possibly it's gonna be two years because we breached the barrier uh, against our, our forests and, and biodiversity, that we have to respect these boundaries. And I hope that education will continue to uh, inspire us to be better global citizens and engage. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you so much. 